first off, um, we had this DJ panel actually back in October. Um, we had Z Trip, Shortcut, Cut Chemist, and we had Newmark. And that was the first DJ panel we had at the W Hotel in Los Angeles. Um, we thought that it was important to have that DJ part of the whole making vinyl movement. And uh, Brian, thanks a lot for uh, having us uh, on board. Uh, today, uh, unfortunately, Newmark couldn't be on the show, but we'll definitely have him uh, on one of these future shows uh, that we plan to do. But we have a very special guest, uh, Rick B. Lou, joining us today. Um, and as you can see, the entire panel we have here are just full of uh, world-class legends as well. Uh, I also want to uh, give a big shout out to uh, Joe from Fat Beats. So he covered for me actually in October and uh, moderated the show then. And uh, just want to give a shout out to Joe and the Fat Beats uh, crew as well. Um, I guess first off, I mean, it will be kind of a bit of a recap uh, for some of you guys, but uh, we'll kind of go around uh, the four of you and uh, run through some of these questions that came up uh, from some of the guests and uh, attendees as well. Um, I guess uh, we'll start off with the first one. If you guys could kind of introduce yourselves and um, let us know when you started DJ and uh, when was your first break onto that stage DJ? How about uh, Lou, if you can start it off with us, for us. <clears throat> okay, uh, Louis Flores, AKA Baby Lou, co-creator of Ultimate Bricks and Beats compilation. Uh, I started um, DJing 1974. I started hardcore digging 1978. My first professional uh, gig was in 1978, the first gig I got paid for. Um, I've been privy now to been DJing all over the world and I'm currently the DJ for Social Mischiefs. Uh, besides that, I'm also a record producer. I've produced guys from uh, Ultra Magnetic, uh, OPOs, uh, stuff for Social Mischiefs. I also produce uh, groups by the name of Two in a Room, which is more on the house side. Um, I help also uh, curate a, a few different records that uh, unbeknownst to people that I worked on, uh, like the Rob Basis Takes Two, that was uh, part of my stuff, my philosophy, uh, with Boogie Down Productions. And I just been, you know, digging since then. Um, worked in numerous record shops throughout my life. Uh, that was always something that, that kept me uh, in what I say in tune with was going to the streets from the world famous rock and soul in New York. I also worked <clears throat> at Unique Distributors, which was one of the biggest distributors uh, of the 80s and 90s. So, uh, in New York, we used to be probably the best import place in, in uh, the United States. And, you know, again, uh, uh, to this day, I still DJ vinyl. Uh, I have an extensive collection, over 40, uh, 45s, well, over 15,000. I have an extensive collection of vinyl, <clears throat> of, uh, pure albums, 75,000 albums, and about uh, 25,000 12 inches. How about you, Z? Uh, let's see. Um, my name is Z Trip. I've been doing this 30 years. Um, I started when I was, you know, 15, 16. Um, it really started for me collecting records. I wasn't really setting out to be a DJ. I was just looking for, um, I would hear a song that I liked on the radio and I'd hear the radio edit. And then I would hear these mix shows where they would play these long extended versions. I was like, where, where, where is that? How, how do I get the seven minute long version of that? So I just started collecting 12 inches based on it had more of the song I was looking for. Um, so that's sort of how it got started. And then I started hearing DJs play and I realized um, just through sort of listening that they were going back and forth between two copies. And then that started my, my um, me trying to emulate what I was hearing. So basically getting two copies of the same record and trying to emulate what I was hearing. Uh, and that, you know, just sort of my crate turned into two crates turned into three crates turned into, hey, why don't you come play your cool records at my party? And so um, it, it kind of started like that for me. It was never really like, I, I never set out to be a DJ. It just sort of, I loved music so much and I loved fusing different styles of music together that it just 
um, turned into a career, uh, which I'm grateful for. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been doing it forever, and uh, my my vinyl collection's out of control. Um, I was I was actually probably one of the people who <laughs> who did the opposite. Um, you know, whatever, six, seven, eight years ago when everybody was like, well, vinyl's done and everyone took all their really rare records and sold them to Amoeba. I was the guy who was actually going to Amoeba and buying them up for like one or two bucks versus, you know, huh. the guy who was, you know, dumping off crates of records. So I actually kind of, you know, added another quarter onto my collection of, of vinyl over the years. So, um, but yeah, stoked to be back again, man. Stoked to, uh, to see all you guys. And um, obviously I wish it was under awesome. better circumstances, but... You know, here we are. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. How about you, Lucas? Or Cut Chemist? Uh, hey, <laughs> Lucas, Cut Chemist. <laughs> you, you blew my cover. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, my math sucks, but uh, I think 36 years, 84 is when I started. And um, Primarily as a, a scratcher, I was already buying record, but um, you know when I saw DST Rocket, yeah. I wanted to scratch. You know, I didn't really have any uh, plan on like you know being somebody that rock doubles. I don't think I even really saw that at the time. It was just a percussive thing. And then when I got uh, when I started listening to the radio, uh, mostly KDAY, uh, around that same time, I started hearing people mix uh, Uncle Jam's Army mix. It's time, you know, Alna Fish, the Soul by Hashim, and then I was like, oh, I got to buy two copies of everything now, you know. Um, so that's when I really started to get into it as far as like the full spectrum of DJing and buying hip hop records. I was already kind of collecting k records and stuff like that as a kid. So just the just the fact that vinyl was involved um, with scratching, I was already hooked just just seeing the record itself before I even saw the maneuver. So um, yeah, that's how it got started for me. Nice. What's your short? Uh, what's up, y'all? Shortcut uh, of the Invisible Scratch Pickles, Beat Chunky Sound, Triple Threat DJs out of San Francisco. I've uh, been DJing since 87. Uh, I'm a product of the, um, the mobile DJ sound system scene that was out here in the Bay Area. Um, pretty much, um, yeah, just uh, started out as um, as a mobile DJ, but then progressed to the um, to the DJ battle circuit, and then um, yeah, was able to uh, become a record junkie <laughs> through uh, throughout the years, and um, yeah, still am. Um, yeah, uh, I'm a bedroom DJ at heart, but um, a selector first for sure. And uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to go after these guys <laughs> to talk about myself. So, but yeah. Now, but your background though, I didn't know that that was like a fake background because that really is your background on your stream. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm not at the uh, studio right now, but this is actually what I have at my studio. That's hilarious. I love it. <laughs> well, it's That's better great. than um, I mean, we could do. Uh, we do this. <laughs> anyway, right there. Put the hat hey, on. Hey, there. Hey. Oh, there. All right. <laughs> hey, sure. Do you have the first mixer you use behind you? Do I have the first mixer I use? Yes. Uh, it's right there. Uh, it's uh, next to the 1150, the new mark. It's, uh, it's uh, called a Pyramid 4700. And that was my pyramid. first mixer. I remember that. I started on a, on a Pyramid. Oh, you want a Pyramid? <laughs> One, I, I don't know if it was that one. I can't see which one it is. Uh, it's next to okay, so not the not the twenty two hundred in the middle, but the next to the uh, not next to the eleven fifty. Next to the realistic? No, the other side. The other side, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, maybe. Man, it's a four channel, a four channel wooden side. Uh, wooden yeah, yeah, channel. one with a yeah, had an four, echo four, on four. the mic. Yeah, uh, no, no echo on the mic. Yeah, I had one that had echo on the mic. That was my first mixer. But then, uh, the, then the realistic is the one that I I beat the shit out of that one. That was the, oh, this, this one right here. Yeah. That one, yeah, the ninety nine dollar Radio Shack joint. Oh, man, yeah. that's the go to. Yeah, I still have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I may use it this Thursday. Maybe I'll use it this Thursday just to like really, like really take it there. Uh, and you better. During my streams, I, I do um, um <laughs> do a stream called Off the Shelves, and I use the twenty two hundred during during those shows. Just to, that's just awesome. To, yeah, so. 
Did you get the PMX fixed? Uh, no. I need. I'm gonna buy another one when I go to Japan. Okay. <laughs> Lou, what did you start off on? <clears throat> I started with the first mixer that had an actual Q point, which was uh, the DM, the Numark DM uh, 500, which came Ooh. out in 1972. And I, which I still have, believe it or not, I used it last Ooh. year. It's still in mint condition. I, I used it last year for a corporate gig that was uh, bringing back, you know, they was, they was trying to keep a, a vintage look. And yeah, that's the mm -hmm. first mixer. You know, like there, there is rumors always that, you know, there was no Cuban mixers back in 73 or 74, but there was in 72. The Numa created the DMM500, uh, which already had a Q system fader and everything on it. That's what the short faders, right? The, the short faders, yeah. yeah. Which is, you know, the father of the 1150. That's the one that mm -hmm. came out right, right before that, the, the 500. Again, it's, uh, I mean, even though you need like uh, two Arnold Schwarzenegger to move the faders because the faders are so, so stiff. Yeah, but yeah. you can still do it. You can still rock with it. Is that yeah, the pre club? Uh, is that pre clubman? Yeah, pre clubman, nineteen seventy two. Mm, okay. It was manufactured in nineteen seventy two out of Jersey. Whew. Okay, so great. I got it in I got it in seventy eight when I got when I first got it. Seventy eight. Personally, but the one that because I the, the the person that I was DJing with sold me the their 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 whole system, which was. The um, SLB 101s and the DM 500 mixer. So that's that's what I started with, and believe it or not, I didn't get 1200s to which is I'm proud to say to 1990 95 when I got 1200s. I DJ with the 101s all the way until 95. Right. Yeah. Which you know, if you think about it, you only had a two and a half percent mid uh, pitch control, you know, min uh, plus or minus, and then you really had to ride that spindle because it's the band. So you had to be light on your hands and have like nine pieces of of plastic underneath the felt so you the things don't rub. So those are the days for me. <laughs> this is the one with the pitch with the yeah. spindle. Right? Yeah, this is the mixer right here. I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, it's kind of rough. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it's kind of rough, but that's the one that I started out with. It's a little DM500 mixer. I can. But I do outpost it, you guys can see it, so it's kind of crazy. But it still works to this day. So, that's the steam. Wow. What was your first gear, uh, Cut Kims? Uh, <clears throat> the Newmark, um, <clears throat> was it the 1100 or the 1150? It had. Wood paneling, uh, and uh, it was silver. I still have it. It's in my my storage, but um, that was the first one. I got it in 84, and the faders were like, the up and downs were this long, and that's how somebody at a, a quinceanera taught me how to de taught me how to scratch uh, stabs, and so he taught me on the up and downs, and I brought that mixer, and so I learned how to stab on those up and downs, so... You know, not to say my stab prowess is anywhere near shortcuts, but you know, I was getting down early on on the on the, and the reason why I was good at it is because I had to practice on this. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, and it was the first party I heard "Living on Video" by Trans X, and I went into a trance at 12 years old. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know what you know, you're thinking about the early days. I started, when I started, I didn't really have anybody to, to, to practice with. And so I actually DJed Hamster thinking it was the normal way to do it. Because, wow. Yeah, yeah, because to me, if you think about it, like if a sound is going out, like the record's going out, the record's going, ah, right? It's going away from you, ah, I thought, the fader should be also going, ah, so everything's going away from you. So if I'm, I'm setting up, I'm like, ah, getting it away from me. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was this way. And so for me, I just set it up, didn't really understand, practiced for, you know, however long it was, year, year and a half by myself doing my thing. And so the first party I went to, I set up my shit and the guy was like, hey, why is your stuff backwards? I'm like, my stuff's not backwards, your stuff's backwards. And <laughs> Clearly, I was completely opposite. So for the next, I don't know, you know, three or five years, whatever it was, 
every party I had to go to, I'd always unplug the RPAs because I that's how I learned. Until we created our own little hamster switch, which reversed the polarity on the uh, on the RCAs. But I had to go to the party or go to wherever early to set up my box just so I could have it there so there was no downtime. So when I jumped on, I could just go click. And then sometimes the shit would not work or whatever, it would short, you know what I mean? So there's always like issues with the, until um, the first hamster switch, which I ever, the first hamster switch I ever had on the mixer was the Vestex, which I remember short was the one who, who showed me that. The, I, the old uh, the one made out of the metal, like the prototype, the heavy one. Gray like one? The, the gray one, yeah, yeah. Still got that. But it was just funny. It made me think of like early back in the day stuff where it's like nobody really taught me how to do it. So I just sort of did it myself. And I started meeting other DJs, like, you know, one in every 30 DJs would be like, I also DJ hamster. I'm like, how do you, what? And so it's like, it's just interesting because there's only, there's like, you know, a few of us, me, DJ Day, you know, a couple other guys who were like, all, yeah, we're like hamster guys. We, we'd all click up because if you're doing, you know, routines or whatever, it's like, we're always a pain in the ass guys. We're like, hang on guys, I gotta you know, move the shit around. So it was always a pain in the ass. But. I actually remember that mixer. That was the, uh, I think it was the, uh, sure, you probably remember it, but I, I mean, you brought the 05 Pro 4, was it the special edition 2 with the hamster switch? It was the red panel you had. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, um, that's actually, uh, on the first prototypes, they got, they installed it in me and Kubert's. Uh, uh, yeah, you guys got the, the special ones, yeah. I still got but the, Z, uh, I remember you were traveling with that Vestex. Uh, I think it was the 05 Pro. Uh, well, I, 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 I've always traveled with my own mixer just because, yeah. I mean, once you get a mixer, it's like anything, like any instrument, right? If you get your guitar where you want it or your keys where you want it, like when you show up and it's, it's, the, it's the one they rented from wherever, there's always a knob missing or it doesn't have the update or whatever. So it's like, at the very least, let me just bring my needles and my mixer, like everything else, and my my records, right? But like everything else you can work around, but like that's your main piece of gear. So I never, it was always a pain in the ass. It's always been a pain in the ass to carry around a mixer everywhere you go. It's like carrying a ball and chain. But like, I, how many times have I shown up and it's like the thing you advance or the mixer you want exactly, it's put it all in the details and you show up and it's like five generations old or it's like some, you know, Somebody just, just like slapped it together. It's like, oh yeah, here, mix on this. And you're like, you know, missing buttons and shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, all right, if we can just go around all four of you guys here with this question. Um, biggest digging story. Yeah. Most valuable record you have in your own. With me, uh, I want to say it was, had to be 1982-83. Lenny and I were already going out. Um, I guess we were the first, okay. We were the first to really start going out on digging ventures. So we went, I think, to, it had to be the North Carolina, South Carolina. And we went to what they call a, you know, a, a, a one stop. So the place was going out of business and we had a little gimmick that we used to do. We used to, you know, set up a pallet and put records on the pallet. And if we saw something that was next to it that seemed like it was in touch, we would slightly move the pallet over to us and just to make sure what, it, you know, um, and see how we can get over it, you know, because people, and this, at that time vinyl wasn't as, as valuable as people put a price on it now. So on this other pallet was, cause this place used to sell imports also, was 75 pieces of the Little Less Conversation yellow Elvis Presley album that had the beat on it. So we get that particular record and the record was going, you know, at that time it was probably going for like seven, $8 or maybe $10 for the import. Uh, and we end up, um, you know, picking it up in, in the boxes and, and there was, uh, like, uh, 650 counts and then, uh, uh, you know, the half a box that was open. So we thought everything was, you know, a little bit less conversation. So we bought everything for 75 cents. When we come back, 
two of the boxes were Skull Snap's original album underneath. Hmm. So that's probably one of the biggest, I guess, ventures for me. Now, as far as most, most valid record for me, it may not be the same for people, even though I, I do have, you know, the Salt hung up. I, I do have an extensive collection of the Sex Pistols 45. I uh, have Beatle original 45s, but my most valuable player uh, record is my mother's copy of Begging, which is a record that she owned in 19, you know, uh, early, late 1968, 69. I think she purchased it and it means the world to me because she's my mom's no longer here. And it's something people that know me, if I get a chance and chance that I get to play, I do play that record. And it's like, very endeared to me. I still have the sleeve. I still have the original 45 and nice. you know, again, that is the most of a sentimental value to me as far as, you know, it's to me it's priceless in comparison to all the other records that I have. And mind you, I have, you know, which I mean, which have become extremely valuable now, you know, the, the, the original copy that I used to record in Peace the President, I do have the original Champ, the original Daisy Ladies, all the records I have, test pressings of, of numerous, you know, uh, from Rufus Thomas to, James Brown, Funky Present, which I posted a couple of times, but yeah, that record is more or less, you know, the 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 golden ticket or whatever you want to call it, the holy grail is everything to me. Nice. How about you, Z? Um, it's hard, man. It's hard to say what my, you know, most valuable record is because they all mean a little something. It's like trying to figure out, you know, who's your favorite child if you have like, you know, 10 children. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't think you can do that. Um, but I mean, you know, I think one that, you know, I, I just, one that pops into my head, the, just because it's super rare and it's super interesting to me, is um, I was digging one day uh, up over by, um, like, Pasadena up in La Cañada, up in that area. I forget the name of the shop. Luke, you might remember the shop, the name that was up there. But it's like a little record store up there. Um, but I'm just digging through, and uh, and I came across this um, acetate test press, uh, uh, or not test press, but an actual acetate. Their you know their reference copy of from Bernie Grudman, and so I knew the sleeve of Bernie Grudman, and I picked it up, and it was an Easy E Easy Does It, and it had like tagged on it. So I'm, I don't know if he did it or somebody did, but it was like a, I pulled it out and I was like, holy shit. And they, I don't think they understood what it was because they were like, it was like five bucks or 10 bucks or something like, they knew it was a, you know, not a record. So they knew it was rare, but they were like, yeah, five, 10 bucks, or whatever. So I picked it up, I took it home and I listened to it. Sounds pretty much the same, but it was just the mere fact that, you know, that you actually had that and there's all the writing on it. And the funny thing is when I went to go get my album made, um, and I had Big Bass Brian, who was actually still at Bernie Grumman's at the time. I took that in. I was like, hey, man, do you remember this? And he was like, oh, shit. So it's like we had that kind of moment. But um, we did a thing on Crate Diggers, and um, uh, Fuse did it. And um, I, that was one of the records I pulled out and, you know, was like checking it out, showing it off, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, like, really rare things that mean something to me that, you know, might not mean something to somebody else. But... Uh, and as far as like the craziest digging stories, um, you know, I don't know. There's so many, you know what I mean? Like, I know, you know, Luke, the clock shop was a, a, a great spot. You know, the, I had good memories there. PDQ was, was great in Tucson. Um, and, you know, there's always a thing of like, <laughs> I'll tell you one crazy story. And this is just, it's, it's sort of bittersweet, but um, there was a record store in, uh, in, in Arizona when I was digging called Tracks and Wax. And um, the there were two owners, they were brothers. One was this heavier set dude and then, uh, and he was the cool guy. And then his other brother was kind of a, a dick. And um, you would go in there and you'd go digging for records. But I remember I went through and I, I spent like a week and a half going through their whole 45 collection with my player digging, digging, digging. Found a little stack about this big of like really great stuff. Took it to the counter and uh and he was like yeah i'd like to take these and he's like cool and he sold me like two of them he's like these others i gotta check out and i was like cool he's like i have to call you back i'm like cool gave him my number whatever waited a day or two called back and he never called me back and finally i went back down there i was like hey man that stack of records i still want to get them he's like what stack of records i don't even know who you are i don't remember you bullshit because i used to always come there all the time so he and i always had this tension 
But the, the next time I came in, the heavier set guy, um, who was a super cool dude, the 45s were gone, but he was always a good guy. But I remember we would talk, whatever. And um, the following day when I came in, uh, I came in and music was playing. And, um, and he was half out. And we were trying to wake him up and stuff. And he sort of was a little groggy. But I remember going in there and there was that moment of like, he's passed out on the floor. I could really take whatever record I want, but like, I don't want to, as, as a revenge for the other brother, but I didn't do that. But it was just kind of crazy. But like, the guy was always, he had a heroin problem. So he was always shooting up and he would always like nod off while he was working. Sadly, the guy died, but like, he was the cool dude. But like those, you know, you always have these weird stories of like the weirdest people that you meet or the weirdest circumstances in trying to obtain a record, whether it's, putting your health health at risk or dealing with some chaos or somebody's whole other world or like having to talk to some, you know, record store owner for 20 minutes just to get the price down fucking 10 bucks, you know what I mean? Whatever the hell it is, like we've all gone through that. But those are some of the ones that, that stick out. I know Luke's probably got a million stories, short probably. What, what was the, what was, Z, what was the store? I mean, um, where was the store uh, for the Easy e thing? Where'd you say it was? Oh, it was in La Cunada. It was, um, it, there was two stores there, and one went out of business first, and the second one was there. I remember yeah. how it looked. La I, I yeah, La Cunada. It was, like, way up in the middle of nowhere, like, up by the foothills, uh, you know. And I was like, okay, I'll check this. And they had, like, a bunch of, like, rockabilly and just kind of, you know, stuff I wasn't into, but they had this thing there, and that's why I don't think they knew it. It was like, oh, shit. So That's cool. That's a good one. Yeah. What would be your short? Oh, um, I agree with um, Z when he says that it's just hard to put put it all on one record. You know what I mean? I think it's more uh, 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 a, 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 you know, I guess for cities that you go to, what are the most memorable cities that you can go to? I mean, hands down, of course, Japan. Just yeah. one in Japan. I, I, uh, there was a point where a point where I never came home with my talent fee. Because <laughs> I just That's spent real. it all on record. I just spent it all on records. Real. You know I mean? real. Uh spent it all on records, spent it all on shipping to yeah. ship it home and you know what I mean? But you know, like this is during a time of course, like, you know, um I mean I didn't I started in eighty seven so I didn't get to grab a lot of the, the real, real hard super hard to get stuff, you know what I'm saying? So I caught you know, usually when you when I know I'm going to Japan, oh cool, I get to catch up on my doubles. Of stuff that I just never had, a, I could never get another copy of. You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, by even to this day, I'd say I still say Japan still. Uh, you know, maybe not like not like the, maybe the mid nineties. Uh, yeah, that was a good time. Yeah, that was a great time. You know. Oh yeah. But um. Oh yeah. But I but for me, um, the best shopping that I do for digging for records is definitely Japan or in uh, in uh, uh, Holland. I don't know if you guys have ever been to uh, Demon Fuzz Records in Rotterdam. Um, that's like a place I could just just give me a, a lamp, water, and a, <laughs> and a, a sleeping bag. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and I'll, I'll stay for the whole day. Just you know what I mean? So. Still. Yo, I just saw uh, it's Foothill Records in La Cunada. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I do remember that place. Um, what's your cut? Uh, so yeah, I think the best digging story and the rarest record may go hand in hand in the, in one story. So I'm gonna try to consolidate. But um, there was a place called Eddie Three Way in New Orleans, and it was in the uh, Garden District, and um, I think, and uh, it was it was a one stop that had uh, been defunct for a while. So it was just a guy that sold records privately out of there. And you had to climb a ladder. There were no stairs to get to the second floor. So outside you had to go up a ladder, get on the attic level. And it was, you know, the floor would cave in. It was dangerous. You were kind of taking your life in your own hands. And, and, and so um, I found out about this spot through Egon. Actually, no, 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 that's right. Through Egon's friend, he spilled the beans. Egon, I don't think, wanted me to know about it. And I was on tour with J5, and, and so I ended up 
this dude Ben and, and Ben was like, Oh yeah, Eddie Three Way and I was like oh. And so uh so I hit that place up and I remember uh, Egon was mad. But um and then Egon and I went back, we flew back over there and really just spent the whole I think like two days. And um and then we went to this other spot called uh Buddy Stewart's in um Mississippi. No, 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 Baton Rouge in Baton Rouge. And I found this record, which is probably one of my rarest records. It's called Gay Papa Cha Cha <laughs> on Custom Sound, which is a, uh, which is, um, a Louisiana label, I, I believe. But anyway, the reason I like, well, first of all, it's rare, but the reason why I really like it is because it's a song that a guy sings over another record. So he's actually kind of proto sampling this record, which is the Sweet Delights on, a, mm. on, on Echo. So he's just playing the record and doing like a, a weird Elvis style, <laughs> like kind of weak chanting over it. It's it's the most bugged out shit. And if you listen to uh, my song, my first big break on my first album, um, the uh, one more time, a little bit more comes from Gay Papa. Yeah. Oh, so. Nice. Well, I, I have an honorable mention as far as priceless. This is the Bang Bang 1 of 45 that Jay Z pressed up oh, with Damien Marley. Damien Marley, yeah. And it's only 1 of 45 and it's, it's signed by him. And it's you. And what's good about this record is that it's actually, it was actually pressed up in, in, uh, in the, in the pressing plant, you know, Damien Molly's pressing plant with the same label, same pressing, same machine, same everything that all Damien Molly 45s are pressed up. Plus, it's signed by him. And again, I, I felt honored that they, you know, with, that, I, that I was looked upon as being one of those guys that that is in the 45 game or the vinyl game that deserved that kind of copy. So that's there's no price on that one because it's only 45 of those particular records signed by him. Yeah. We're on, well, while we're on this topic, i um, just going to cover this question that came in from, uh, I think, Drew. It's the same question online and what you emailed in. But what are your favorite break or sample? Shit. Yeah, that's crazy. Another question. Like, how do that's, you answer that? You know that's I mean? worse than your favorite child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hard. That's too hard. I mean, I mean, today I could tell you what mine is today. Maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, that'll change yeah. in like two hours, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And there's some records you don't want to give away either, but you know, so that's a different story in itself. Oh, yeah, yep, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. yeah, there's some, there's a lot of samples. Like right now, I just, I just finished Opio's album, and at least everything's sampled on it, and at least twelve of the records that are there are samples that pretty nobody really. I mean, very few may know if anybody. So I just, that's most definitely I can't give no samples away like that. Have I give away too many in my lifetime. <laughs> have you guys? heard of this one called Apache? It's <laughs> Don't say. I'm not going to tell you who it is. You're going to have to find it yourself. But there that you one's good. Un Ungoogleable. It's ungoogleable. <laughs> yeah. It's too hard to name your favorite break, man. Come on. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, I, yeah. I appreciate the effort, but it's just, you know, yeah, too hard. You Although, get us, you know, drunk, get us all drunk around a turntable, though, we'll fucking tell you all our favorite breaks. <laughs> I'll tell you the first, uh, one of the first breaks I ever found, and this is before I think I even knew about breaks, and um, it was Scorpio by Dennis Coffey. And a friend of mine brought some of his dad's records over, and we weren't even like, breaks weren't even in our mm -hmm. dialogue. I don't know why he did it. I think he was just like, hey, it might be fun to scratch my dad's records. And I remember just based off the, the beginning drum roll, the dun dun. I was like, oh, that's like the same drum roll from um, One for the Trouble. That's cool. So I started to kind of piece together that hip hop culture was using something older than itself to make it, you know? And then, and then from there, I, I, uh, I, I became um, a fanatic and when I heard uh, Danny Krivitz's fusion, uh, fusion Beats, right? No, no, I'm sorry. 
uh, Phil and James. And, mm -hmm. um, and I remember going out to uh, try to find that beat because it was the most futuristic beat. And I heard it in 86 around the bridge and um, all these contemporary game-changing rap records. But to me, when I heard that, that, that record, that James Brown beat, I was like, that's the most future shit ever. Love the, you know, all this Molly stuff, but damn, what is that? And, um, and then I went out to Tower Records to try to find it. And I figured it was James Brown, but I just didn't know which one. So I remember buying all this stuff like blindly trying to figure it out. And because um, it was all sealed, right? I wasn't going to a used record mm -hmm. store. And then finally, when I saw In the Jungle Groove and I flipped it around, I said, Funky Drummer. I was like, that's got to be it. I'll be damned if that's not the beat. I mean, it's called Funky Drummer. And so I brought it home and it was it. And I got so excited. And that was my first really quote unquote digging. Not that that was the question or I'm answering anything, but I just, it just, I just thought of it. And, uh, and from there, I was like, whoo. So you can add Funky Drummer to that list, too. How about all your guys' DJ influences? Who are your all influences? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll start with this one for me, because it's very clear. Um, the, the first two DJs that really, really uh, made an impact on me, um, I was living in New York at the time, and it was, uh, it was Marley Mall and Red Alert. And they used to have a mix show on at the same time. And so the deal was you had to get cassettes and have two separate radios going where you could record both for Friday and Saturday. So you had tunes for the week. And those were also where I would listen to those cassettes. And if there was a song I didn't know, I would take the cassette into, you know, wherever I was going, whatever record store, upstairs records, downstairs records, rock and soul, wherever it was, be like, Hey, what is this? Does anyone know what this is? And some, you know, if I was lucky, I'd find somebody who was like working behind the counter who was, who would be like, oh, that's this. And he'd go over and he'd pull it out and be like, yes. You know what I mean? But if, uh, so it was always kind of the hunt. Like that was the, the early Shazams was bringing in the cassettes. You know what I mean? But it was, it was Marley and Red Alert for sure. Um, you know, and, you know, there were obviously like, you know, Flash and Jazzy J and all the people prior, but those two guys were the first ones where I was like, I really studied them because I got to hear them um, being young and not being able to go anywhere. That was the first time when, you know, you got to understand when stuff was broadcast, we would receive it. It's kind of like what Cut was saying about the the DST um, doing Rocket, you know, on the American Music Awards. Like when we all saw that, that was like huge because it was broadcast and everyone got to receive it. So that was the thing we all talked about the next day in school. It was like, holy shit, did you see it? Yeah, I recorded it. No, I'm coming over to your house to watch it. Like, so... Having the cassettes, uh, which I still have, of Red Alert and and Marley on BLS and Kiss, like, and all the cool little features and people that would come in and like, you know, do freestyles and, and everything. Like to me, that was where I that was my blueprint for like, oh, this is how it has to be laid out sonically. Like I understand it. So, for me. How about you, Short? Um. Well, coming from the Bay Area, and like I said, I I, I came from the uh, the mobile DJ sound system scene. Um, the three kings here were DJ Apollo, Mixmaster Mike, and Qbert. Um, you know, just being like in junior high and getting the flyers, seeing them. If you knew that they were on the flyer, it was gonna be, that's like where everyone was gonna go for the weekend. And um, yeah, you know, what I mean, um, just just you know, there was just such a new, you know. Apollo was the big DJ out here, but then, you know, um, Mike and Q would always be scratching over what Apollo mm -hmm. would be mixing and, and playing, you know what I'm saying? So that was just a big influence on me, just seeing them, just seeing four turntables lined up. And that was like, what, 89? You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I mean, those are my biggest influences. And, and you know, it's just, for me, it's just a trip to, to be part of the, their crew after looking up to them for so long so um oh. but yeah to this day i mean you know those those are still my idols straight up so. um for, for, for me uh, uh tony gonzalez tony g from the mix masters kda mm -hmm. mix masters um game changer and i think he was the gateway to you know joe cooley's and the aladdin's and um m walks and stuff like that I, I think it went tony g then m walk and then joe mm -hmm. cooley Aladdin for me that's pretty much chronologically too um 
Um, uh, Egyptian Lover, uh, Bobcat was major. Uh, Uncle Jam's Army was major for me because they were the K-Day Mix Masters before the Mix Masters and, and, and the kind of the Wrecking Crew before the Wrecking Crew. You know, they, they set the template in LA hip hop and doing mix shows on the radio. They had, um, talk about four turntables. I think they maybe had 10, I'm not sure, but it sure sounded like it. And it was live and um, that, w that was huge. Truck Chill Out and Red Alert, like Z said, I mean, going out to New York in, in that golden era for me, like my golden era is eight, late 80s, 87, 88, 89, and I was in New York those, time, those summers and recording those shows and they were just electric. I would bring them back and like I discovered Plutonium, bring them back home and be like, guys, you got to check this shit out. Yeah. And um, it was really that that was that was the energy that helped uh, create such a, I guess like you know helped me create the vibe for Unity Committee, which became Jurassic Five and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean those are just a few, but there, there's so many. I mean DST, Lou. I mean, without the ultimate breaks and beats, forget it. I mean, you know, what would hip hop culture sound like? You know, it's like. Right. Right. Taking color out of painting, you know. So, yeah, um, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I could give you a laundry list of DJ influences. Koala, Kid Koala, as far as uh, DJ performers, he's at the top, you know, like eclecticism and um, a unique take on the tool as a DJ and how to express yourself. It doesn't get any better than Kid Koala, you know. Um, I mean, you know, like I said, everybody has their lane and, and it's amazing that everybody, there's so many lanes to choose from, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be a DJ, Absolutely. you don't have to play, you know, popular songs or keep people dancing. You can be a complete weirdo, whack job and express yourself in some unique way and do it through DJing. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about it. It is true. So really quick, while we, uh, while, We've got Breakbeat Lou here, and we're talking about records. I just also want to, I just remembered this. The first time I ever got a credit card, the first, my first credit card where I was like, hey, I can actually buy stuff, right? Uh, I had a $500 limit, and the first thing I bought with that was, remember how they used to have, like, the, uh, I forget what it was, in like, some of the trade magazines or whatever in the back, they'd have, like, buy the Ultimate Breaks and Beats collection, doubles. And I was like, yo. So that was my first credit card purchase because I had like one of like or two of one, like one of the other. Like I, I couldn't find them because they were always like not in a group. So my first uh, credit card um, bill was like me buying up all those records and I got them delivered. And it's like, I still got them. They're still the same ones. You know what I mean? And uh, but yeah, that was my first. And then I was like, oh, cool. Awesome. And it took me months to pay it off. Right. But like that was the first. <laughs> I need that, like, I need the ingredients. Without these ingredients, I'm, I'm nothing. Like, I need the ingredients. This is salt and pepper. Like, this goes in every dish. Get them, no matter what the cost is. So that was a, so Lou, shout out, salute. Yeah, Thank bro. you. And, and, you know, Lou, Lou, by the way, um, <clears throat> the thing that really got my crates deeper in the, in the beginning was, for some reason, one of my copies of Ultimate Breaks and Beats had um, a list of every song and the group for some reason like on every volume like i don't know why it was in there maybe it's a promo copy not sure but mm -hmm. it had a typed out list of every record and the group isn't on there it's kind of like you know right it's ambiguous kinda, right yeah. and so i had a master list and i went oh damn you mean cool is back is by um a group Monty. called incorporated <laughs> yeah. you know or like you know long red is mountain live you know and so we use that list to go find these records and it really helped out we were like oh shit found this found this found this and so yeah i mean it was because of those volumes and particularly that list and those volumes putting them together which was my that began my like really deep crate digging yeah i mean and and that was the reason why we 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 did that i mean i i can only speak for myself those records were created which i mean the first one that we created to be in that manner was the fusion beats, you know, because that was a uh, two tapes that were given to us by uh, Bambada. And he goes, yo, because um, we were putting out bootleg 12 inches before they said, put this out. I think it'll be something good for you guys to put out. 
when we put that out, that changed the demographic of how what we were doing with single records and having multiple records. As you know, Fusion Beats, you know, had you know three records within the side. You know, we introduced the world to both the Dyke and the Blazers and and the the Mohawks. So yeah. uh, you know, we created. I said we. Cre- I you know, honestly speaking, myself, again, we created those records to facilitate the second generation or third generation of DJs to have like Zero Singh the main ingredient of what hip hop was, meaning these organic beats, these, you know, this, this particular sound that we, you know, were, were used to because in, in the beginning of the eighties, they started cutting up a lot of rap records back in those days. So, you know, we, I, we, I know I felt that we need to have the schoolyard still in, 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 in the, in the culture. So that's the reason why those records were created. Now, as far as my influences, my influence are, they change in different ways as far as my career. Of course, the, the initial is Jay Z and I mean DJ Jay Z from the Herculoids and Jazzy J. Jay Z the Herculoids, he's the first guy that I know that was doing beat drumming, single turntable beat drumming. And and then this is back in had to be 76, 75, 76. He was doing that already oh. before the scratching. You know was. I mean, the theater was scratching already, but he was doing this beat drumming thing back in those days. Um, second second tier for me was my brother in law because he's the one that first bought me my first equipment. Uh, third tier is Grandmaster Grandmaster Kaz because he was DJ first before he was an MC. And then Charlie Chase, as far as Charlie Chase was the best DJ that I've ever seen, and I'm taking anything from anybody rocking for MCs on the stage. He always kept it tight for them guys. And then when it came to production, to taking the DJ into production, to me it had to be the Latin Rascals because they were, they were creating these edit montage that were incredible, which entailed, you know, enabled me to get into editing, which that, uh, you know, got me physically involved with doing the break beat. So it's those four tiers, DJ JC, Jazzy J, my brother-in-law, Kaz and Charlie Chase and then the Latin Rascals for me. Wow. That's amazing, man. Um, Jesus. Questions are piling up. Um, I do still have a couple other questions that came in earlier, but uh, I guess this is an important one, too. Moving forward, I mean, for all you guys, um, just uh, going out there and DJing again. It's, it, it's going to be different, um, obviously, with COVID-19 and just the whole, uh, globally, things are changing. How do you see moving forward in regards to going out there and DJing again, uh, out in front of everyone, events, you know, venues, festivals, and whatnot? And obviously, you know, some of you guys are also now streaming, too. So, you know, you have that new platform as well. But uh, how do you guys see it moving forward? Well, to me, I mean, there was always obstacles in the culture of hip hop. You know, they said it was going to be a fad for us and DJing, like the way we do it is going to be a fad. And we've always tend to survive. And I know this is slightly different than what everything else was. But I think we will find, I mean, the music speaks for itself. You know, music is the, the connection that we all have. And one thing I can say about everybody that's here in this particular panel, you know, this is... And I know all these guys pretty pretty well, and these guys are true lovers of music first and foremost, and they they, they love the music, they respect the music, and they love the craft, and they love the craft. And and I think we all will find a way somehow, some way to to coexist with with the new obstacles that there are before us in that sense. And 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 I, I feel this when you have passion behind something and you truly do it. With, with, with a, a sincerity of, of, of heart and a sincerity of, of, of just being a performer and, and giving, you know, cause there are, there are a lot of DJs out there and I'm not dissing nobody that become the spectacle, but these guys here, like I said, I've seen most of these guys play and these guys give a show to you. Like I've seen Zitra do what he does and he's incredible. You know, Cut Chem is the same way. He's like extremely, you know, innovative and, and creative. Shortcut is a freaking alien to me. And when I see him rocking, many different ways and 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 i know me personally i i people that know when i rock i i i put everything out there i leave everything out there i may not be the best technical guys in the world 
compete with those guys. But I know my selection and, and my transitional aspect and party rocking. And, and I, I don't say this boastfully, you know, and I'm not saying I'm the best, but it's the, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to remember me when I rock for you. So, and, and I think when, when you have DJs like this, and, and, and most DJs that, are, that we know for sure are of that crop and, and of that cloth, I think, you know, it will, it will survive again with that. It will survive the, the process. It, it just takes cooperation with us as a people, you know, being more cautious and, 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 and being aware of, you know, what we're dealing with, with you know, with taking the, the necessary uh, precautionary measures and, 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 and move forward. But I think the, the music is something that would never be, you know, extinguished, especially if we continue to love it and respect it the way we do. Yeah, I um, I I want to chime in here really quick on this, just because uh, I there's a couple things I've seen that have have been incredible shifts in uh, almost like you know I I liken what we're going through now, kind of like when we all made the jump from just doing vinyl to go to Serato, for instance. Like there was this moment where like you either got on board and you didn't abandon vinyl, but you just learned a new thing, and that's kind of like with streaming. I think that's the new thing is is because we're all home, because everyone's sort of regulated to being, um, you know, not being able to gather up and, and, and do live shows proper, this is the next best thing. Um, the good mm -hmm. thing about this though, I feel is it's brought skills way back to the forefront for two reasons. One, um, you're watching, you're forced to watch. There's, you know, depending on what sort of production you have around you, um, that can only kind of do so much because the real focus is now on the hands and on the skills and on the mixing and you get a bird's eye view of what's going on. And for a lot of people who just would go to the party and be hanging out with their friends and drinking or partying and they'd see the big visuals or the lights or whatever, they didn't really understand what was going on or what could be done. And now they're seeing it for the first time. And I'll go back like a month, month and a half ago, I did a, a set for Insomniac, um, who are the guys who throw EDC festival. And, right. um, you know, normally when you think of a festival like that, you walk into that festival, you know, thousands of people there and there's like nine stages, the hip hop stage or not even the, you know, whatever, the, the bass stage, the, the, the house stage, the techno stage, whatever. So if you love one style of music, you just go to your stage and you're there. With this, they were, there's one camera angle and everyone who's there for that event is seeing one camera angle and they're seeing you under a microscope. So the fact that the skills are being, um, showcased again and if you take advantage of that i did it i did my set there and <clears throat> i brought my my turntables to it so i didn't do it on cdjs like the rest of the djs did and um people were like what the fuck is this guy doing oh my god I, they didn't know they've never seen it so there's this thing of us exposing this craft to people for the first time and certain people are really getting on board with it and i think the cool thing about it is um moving forward, I just don't know how many of the people who don't do that sort of thing are going to um, be held in the high regard as much as they used to be. And or the flip side is, I don't think that people like us who do this are going to be looked at as like, oh, yeah, they're just, you know, whatever, old school, whatever. It's like the fact that the craft and the skills and the, the level of selecting and, and timing and everything that goes into it, I think is starting to sort of ride um, front seat again, which is really, really good. Like one of my favorite quotes in that whole thing, again, having all these people not ever seeing turntables or, or scratching, my favorite quote in the chat room, somebody said, oh, he's DJing, DJing. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. Right, like that's what's happening. So I feel like um, moving forward, you know, when we do get a chance to get back out in public, I just think the, the awareness, like this was a major reset in so many levels, not just, um, technically, um, but socially as well. I mean, the fact that, you know, the world is behind the Black Lives Matter movement, but there's, you know, there's this whole reset that's going on socially, environmentally, musically, you know, I feel like in our cos microcosm in the DJ world, it's very much like that, like real skills are being pushed back to the forefront. And watching some of these other DJs who are great selectors, who are great producers, who actually, you know, can put together cool sets, but watching them with nothing else around them. It's like watching somebody do an acoustic set or like right. a, get to see the guts. Some of them can't carry a tune, man. And that's real. You know what I mean? And like, no, not to shit on them. It's just like, 
when you when you see that as a as a consumer, you see somebody up there who you clearly can see all all the bells and whistles were what were propping this person up versus somebody who might only have one camera but is killing it. You kind of start to go, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna invest my time and energy into this, and so I'm starting to see like my fan base is there, but I'm like getting a whole new wave of people who are mm. just now getting into mm. this. To me, mm. that's the 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 blessing in in all of this. You know what I mean? I mean, that's I think so. Ford probably sees it. Probably sees. It. I mean, probably all see it. But to me, that's the that's the biggest thing, uh, the upside to this. Yeah, our audience yeah. potentially is exponentially greater because it's not people who physically go buy a ticket and go to the place that has a capacity. Mm -hmm. It's anybody that has Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, cut if you could. Um, Show us what that last stream you just did. I mean, that was a dope, dope one. Yeah, so for, put uh, well, oddly enough, the same title, uh, uh, there was a, there's a group called Last Night a DJ Saved My Life, and it's uh, a charity organization. And so they did, um, with Carl Cox and Nightmares on Wax, organized, I think, one of the biggest uh, festivals that lasted all weekend. I, I'm not sure how many thousands of DJs participated, but it was for um, clean water and food for families in Uganda. And um, yeah, it was called Set for Love and Nightmares on Wax hit me up because I was supposed to do uh, open up for him in Colorado, but COVID hit. And so we couldn't get it together. We were both really psyched about the show. And, um, and so he just hit me up and, and asked me to be a part of this. And I don't do a lot of streaming performances i do kind of like you know just kind of like candlelight vigils you know kind of weird things like that but um this was my first real performance <clears throat> but cut can i i want to I, I wanted to mention about that cut that you when you doing that and i want to commend you on that i'm glad we, we're in this forum mm -hmm. cut ended up to me showing people the true essence of what a dj should do in a sense because he let the records breathe so people can absorb and hear the full music. Because most time, you you know, in this day of, of DJing, and I'm not dissing anybody, if you get 30, 45 seconds of a record, is a lot. But mm -hmm. Chemist is doing these things that to you know, let people enjoy the record, the songs. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but I wanted to, I wanted to give you props on that because you let people know that there is more to a song than just what you normally hear on a particular mm -hmm. record. Or and there's more than just playing one particular 90s hip hop for two hours, you know, and there's more other stuff in the thing. So I thank you for that, brother. And I'm sorry. Uh, I just uh, oh, no, no, I appreciate you jumping in because I wouldn't have, I would have just flew right by it. But um, yeah, when COVID hit, you know, it was a way for people to, for me to invite people into my living space because I wasn't going to them. So I had to bring them to me. And not to sound like a weirdo, but I can't listen to records all the time. I mean, that's what I do on my off time at night if I'm not DJing out. It's just a really weird, chill thing to do as an adult. So I was like, well, why not bring that to the people? And it, it's almost like music appreciation where let's just play records, one turntable, candle, in the dark, and play cool shit. And so that's what I started doing. I think I did like four of them. Um, I hit up Lou for the Mother's Day one, I said, can I please play Begin? Because I can't, you know, like, that's like one of the all time great Mother's Day shout outs Lou does every time. And it, it and it's, it, it hits me. So I was like, can I play that? And he's like, yeah, of course. So we, I did a Mother's Day one. I think that the last one was, um, that was the one before the last. So yeah, and that's been cool. But as far as a performance, I only, I've only done one stream so far. Like a, you know, cut it up. You know, yeah. stuff. No, it was it was dope and definitely Thank for you. a great cause. Short, I, I know you're probably the busiest one, right? Yeah. Was it, was it seven days a week? <laughs> no, not seven days. I I was going six um three months ago when I first started on Twitch. I was doing six days a week, but now you know my daughter is off uh, school, so I got I took a day off, and now I'm Wednesday to Sunday. Um, I I must say what you know, like how uh, Cut was saying that you know. The, the thing that came out of this whole COVID thing. Um, for me personally, I think it's just, just when I do shows, the automatic thing that mm -hmm. people 
get from me or expect from me is just to do a scratch thing or juggle or you know I me mean, just do like more turntable stuff but i think being streaming see um when i stream every night i actually do a different theme every night of a different genre of music so just kind of sh- now it's I'm, I'm able to i was able to grasp a whole new audience that don't know me for that you know or have never even heard of me you know what i'm saying and, and and i think now that it just shows oh wow i didn't even know you play this like i didn't know you play this kind of stuff or you play house or you play you can play a, a new jack swings or just just you know what i mean and i i i just want you know at the same time with now it's like now everyone that everyone's home i just try to think of it like what can i do what should i do to make you guys what can i do to make you guys stay here for like the whole next hour or two hours without you know what i mean trying to go somewhere else yeah. but um i mean you know it's it's i'm just thankful that now like i for the longest time I'm, I'm, i've honestly been trying to break out of that that you know that thing that everyone just thinks all i do is scratch you know what i mean because i come from the scratch pickles of all groups you know what i mean and i love that i came you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm thankful i came from that scene but you know what i mean uh first and foremost i'm a selector dj you know what i mean at heart um i always consider like my, my scratching and all that stuff to just be the spice of what i do but you know what i mean but um yeah i mean that's that's i think right now is the best time as a dj you know what i mean especially i see and i see a few of them a club uh some club djs who are known just to like you know they, they're known to play all the new club stuff or whatever but then now it's like like what you guys the rest of you guys said like now this is the time for you to really show you know yourself as a as a selector, you know what I mean. What's yeah. what's your what's your music taste? What you know, what's gonna set you apart from everybody? And um, I think uh, I, I'm just thankful now that I've been able to do that um, through all this. So that's like the positive thing through all this pandemic stuff. And you know, um, I think, as far as come, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I, I was gonna say I think that's the most crucial thing. Not to interrupt, but I think it's the most crucial thing is right now before we get back to the clubs and everyone wants to get back to the norm. Like, you know. The, the weirder you can get, the, the more you can dig into your crates and play those records that you bought that you're like, I always want to play these, I but I never had a to. Now is the time, you know? I do a drum and bass set, I did a house set, I did a, a reggae set, I did a chill set. Um, I'm going back and revisiting old mixes of mine and talking about them, whatever, but like anything that I could do that's not the norm, because again, like you with the scratch thing, everyone's like, oh, you're a mashup guy, cool. And they just put you on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're a scratch guy, put you on the shelf. Oh, you're Breakbeat Lou. Yeah, Breakbeat Records. Cool. Great. Off the shelf. And it's like, how could you do that when you're dealing with people like us who are so into other things? Like, of course I want to hear Shortcut play a house set. Of course I want to play a house set. Like, when do I ever get a chance to do that where, you know, playing a chill set? Like, I can't play a chill set in a club. Like, people come there to, like, turn up and get loose. Like, Hey man, we're all just going to, here, we're all just going to be chill. Like, enjoy it. Like, you can't. Like, but the thing is, when everyone's at home and they're on their couch, there's not, you don't really want to turn up. You kind of Netflix and chill. You want to chill. You want to, you're at home. Mm-hmm. You wanna, so it's like selecting. I found that selecting and playing tunes, like I played a, a set where there was no drums for like three to five minutes and I was just doing this acapella weird thing. And that was the highlight of the set for some people. So it's like that mentality of you don't have to, you know, now is a great time to, to change it up. So I didn't mean to interrupt short, but like that was what you said. I was like, yes, this is exactly what we, I want to see. I think we all want to see out of DJ. Yeah, no, that well, also, and, and just to further uh, interrupt short, sorry. <laughs> uh, but also keep in mind, like, uh, you know, the idea of programming a night in a club, you know, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to have the chill stuff first or whatever. You don't know what order people are watching things on the internet, you know, like, so so it's like oh i don't know if people want to chill right now but in in london maybe they're just getting up or in this place or maybe i just saw uh a um a shortcut set where he completely tears it apart or scratching with his lady and i want to see a chill set right now is there anybody doing a chill set oh boom he's doing one right now shit i'm i'm in so you don't know like there's no you don't really have a sense of programming so you just got to go for it you know, it's not like, oh, well, now it's not the time. We got to amp it up right now. We got to pick it up three levels. Uh, forget all that. Because somebody's doing that simultaneously as you're doing the chill set or whatever set, the reggae set. Or, you know, it's all right there at that moment. And plus, there's archiving. 
Right. Mm -hmm. so, you know, people can list things in order as, as they want. So, yeah. Sorry, short. No, no, that's. I mean, you guys, you guys see it. It's, 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 it's a. Right now, you know, uh, uh, along with everything else, especially with the streaming thing, I think the rules are just being made as we go, too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How to do, how to stream, how to, you know, what's, what's, you know. There's no, there's no blueprint to this, <laughs> really. You know what I mean? So I think, um, uh, but also it's a good th thing too. It's a, yeah, like what, uh, what to touch on what uh, Z Trip was saying. It's now filtering out a lot of DJs who are just, uh, you know, who the DJ DJs. I, I mean, mm -hmm. not the, just any other DJ who's trying to DJ, but you know what I mean. Like just the, you know what I mean. Like now the the microscope is on you. You're we're watching you as opposed to being at the club, you know what I mean? Like we're actually watching what can you do? What are you what are you doing right now? That you know what I mean? And the skills and all that stuff is is now coming out and it shows definitely, you know what I mean? Um yeah, yeah. very important point. Well um sorry guys, I know we're uh, ten minutes over. But um geez, I think I only got through maybe two out of these ten questions, thirteen questions still left. Well, somebody um, one, somebody asked, what was Chet Nunez like? Would anybody know? Uh, Lou? Well, Chet Nunez, he was he was my mentor. He's the guy, I mean, this, you understand something. Chet Nunez was the guy that taught me how to edit. Chet Nunez and I were uh, partners, and we created the original Beat Junkies. As people know, the Beat Junkie name was created by him and I back in 85. Um, he... You know, him and I were like the second coming. You know, we, we was, that 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 was what we would uh, label almost the second coming of Latin Rascals or a combination of Latin Rascals and CNC Music Factory until he passed away. I mean, we did a couple of records. We would, uh, at that time it was mainly on the house side. Uh, we did stuff with Two in a Room, so we had a, a distinctive sound. Uh, we probably was one of the first groups of first, first producers to really create records. Um, with heavy bass line along with hip hop sam uh, samples on it, with you know, with drum with great beats. Uh, he probably, to me, again, I'm maybe biased, he probably was the fastest editor that I've ever known. Plus, the, his best quality, which he, what he taught me was that as an editor or, or, um, or a producer, the best thing um, that you can do is make sure that the arrangement of a record is proper. So, mm -hmm. he, he, you know, that's what people like. Everybody from you know Chef Pettibone to uh, Amy Grant to uh, Duran Duran, they like to use them for that reason because back in the days those had those that uh, were producing back in the days. Remember, we used to have multiple uh, half-inch reels as mixes, and you had to put mixes together. So Chef mm -hmm. was the kind of guy that his memory was so incredible that he would know he would listen to the reel and know what was what and what real. And he know what to get snippets of and bring things into perspective. I mean, like people don't even know. You know, him and I edited the first uh, uh, three records, uh, three singles from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We did Duran Duran, uh, Notorious. We did um, uh, who else was it? Um, Skinny Puppy. We did so many different groups in those days because of our of the arrangements that we were able to do. So. He was okay. probably to me the epitome of of editing, you know, to to its full extent. Not just the multiple edits, but taking the, the whole concept of of editing to a whole. Wow. Sick. Wow. That's cool. Um. And mind you, yeah, this I'm, is I'm not gonna... Pro Tools. This is uh, this is uh, actually. Play play. Play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, like the, the creepy guy that just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Appreciate oh, what you guys are doing. Off. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Brian, I don't think we're going to finish up these questions. Probably have to do another part two down the road. But uh, yeah, um, I, would, I would really like to be able to do that. It, you know, this was a great opportunity to hear from really the legends and uh, very grateful for you guys taking time out of whatever you're doing to share your experiences, influence our audience. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy of how this went. And I really hope that we can do more of this together. 
Yeah. Well, I'm thankful that you guys added me to this uh, to this slew of incredible DJs that I respect highly. You know, uh, I know you guys had Numa before, but I'm I'm thankful for being the substitute that you guys decided. And you know, again, if, if it comes again, I'm, I'll be more than honored to to come back aboard with you guys. Again, it was again all these guys here are all guys that I respect heavily. So I thank you guys again. I couldn't yeah. think of a better a better person to have in this forum. Lou. Absolutely. Yeah. For real. Thanks, Thanks Lou. Appreciate it, John. Um, yeah, before I uh, uh, end this off. Um, yeah, what's that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> what's the boxes? Come yeah, on. I, I always have these little toys I get from Japan here. Um, this is the uh, toy record maker. And this event is <laughs> called Making Vinyl. So uh, what better than having something that you can actually cut your own little vinyl at home with? Wow. So this came out a couple months ago in Japan. Um, uh, it was put together by Yuri Suzuki. Uh, shout out to him and Gakken, which uh, is something I grew up uh, with as well. It's, it's kind of like a is monthly that thing that comes up. Um, it's right here, it's pretty much a seven-inch vinyl. They come with ten plates that you can cut on. Seven-inch vinyl. You you, you 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 could piece it together, and. Um, so that's there's a, a couple, that's there's a couple of videos online that I would definitely recommend you guys check out because uh, um, it's 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 all in Japanese. Like, so Chad, so Chad Japanese. what you're saying is those are the partying gifts for the participants today. So um, <laughs> yeah, just to, as an appreciation from the guys over at Stokyo. Um, I'm local. I come pick up in an hour. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, they're out here. <laughs> I'm they're out here. come out to the I South Bay. They're down here already. So. I must, um, interrupt here, is... must interrupt here and say that as oh. a DJ, I need doubles, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that works. Well, just a little <laughs> gift for you guys. Um, I appreciate you guys, you know, spending time. Um, for all those of you guys listening, uh, you can pick them up either at Stokio or, or at our homies uh, out in New York, Turntable Lab. They got some too. But, um, yeah, very cool piece. And... Uh, Kind of a, a, a making vinyl 101. So there you go. That's what's up. There you so go. Um, definitely, um, I will keep in touch with you guys, and uh, hopefully Please we do. Uh, do something like this again. Yo, I want to do, do. I want to do an all set using everything I make on that. Ooh. Like a all yeah. set, Ooh. and we'll stream it. You know, it'll be a thing. Like we can all get down do a festival. You using be dope. Those. Be dope. That's a good idea. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be announced on Making Vinyl. Come on, makingvinyl.com. There you You'll go. see all of that there. Love it. Okay, guys. Well, thank you very much again. Stay safe. And uh, we'll brother. keep in touch. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, care, everybody. Brother. Appreciate Thanks, it. Guys. Yeah, take care. Stay safe. Later. Later, guys. Thank you, everyone.